Yeah, it says anything, but yeah, also we're not transferring the responsibility of the tech yeah. from them to, to us. Um, I think yeah. the company is good enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we might need some help when um, the Q towards the end, the QA, like some like goes around yes. and stuff. Um, yeah. Right around. 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 Somebody, I assume Jen will come and yeah, Jen chair that session of the afternoon. Who's chair? Jen is related to health. He's chair. Jen is 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 chair. Jen Good You'll be chairing this session, right? Uh, yes, apparently. Okay. Is there someone chairing the Q and A at the end? Uh, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, cool. Thanks, fine. Um, <clears throat> we don't have any time allocated. Uh, here we go. Yes, I um, I need to know, because that's your point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, when I give my so your very slides, brief one. Do you have um, slides to share or are you just going to speak? Sorry? Do you, are you speaking? Yes, I'm speaking. Yeah. I haven't got any slides. That's fine. So, so you just come and stand here. One yeah. of us will uh, position the camera so that you're in view. So right. you can see it in the bottom okay. corner of that screen there. You can see me. Okay. Um, so okay. you'll we'll position so, that. Yeah, and you'll yeah, hold one of those two microphones and speak right. to it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I shall do my best. <laughs> so, but you're after the coffee. You're after the coffee break. So oh, know. is there? Yes, yes, it's it's on break. Uh, oh, right. Oh, right. Yes, yes I'm with, uh, after yeah, Simon. Um, so you're yeah, both yeah, talking. Yeah. Well, no. I think he's doing his bit first. Yeah. What's one slightly like terrifying? Just we just have a two-man act, and I, I don't you know can wear it like a necklace. But I know roughly. I like this on the hoof. Nick, can you hear me? It's not in I, Nick, I, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, not, um, I think. Hello? Hello? Hello, Nick. It's Simon here. Simon! Good <laughs> afternoon. How wonderful to see you. How are you? <laughs> Very well, thank you. Outrageous reprimand. How, how, everything good? Yeah, so you've just gone out of screenshot. I can't see you now. Oh right. Um, but yeah, I just heard you. I just heard my name, and my ears burnt. So uh, oh, right. you were just worrying there. I think when I was going to turn up. So here I am. Don't worry, I'm here. Well, I, I, I saw you. I, I actually sent you a, 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 a text, but I, I'm not sure that it's ever actually gone because I can't get anything to come in or go out from here. So um, uh, it, the Wi-Fi absolutely refused to work for me. Uh, but um, but anyway, I'm long to to um, hear exactly what you say because I'm just hoping that what I say meshes in with it. I think it will. I hope so. I've got a fairly good idea of the sort of thing you're going to say. Well. So. Uh Okie dokie, so we're uh, presumably are covering this little slot between us. So have I got seven minutes? You're at seven. Ah, well, I, I, I was reckoning you were having ten minutes and I was having five, which I think oh, okay. was six. But That's uh, yeah. when I ran through it last night, I, I, I got it almost written down because otherwise I'm never going to get across what I want to say in so short a time. So if I start um, uh, ad living, it'll it'll be a disaster. So uh, I thought I better <laughs> I better be a little bit more sensible. Okay, then. I'll do ten. You have five. That's great. Is that all right? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'll put. I'll see if I can push six. But it won't be more. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you got all that stuff I sent you um, on uh, thir Thursday, Friday. I get. I imagine. Yeah. Um, are you, you going to be talking much about that or not? <laughs> Uh, we'll see. I'm just I'm just putting the final touches together. Right. OK, because I'm largely dealing with that because obviously it's what I'm really talking yep. to be talking about. 
Okay, okay. Yeah. I'll focus <laughs> mainly on here then. Um, but uh, I thought you must have it because obviously it's hugely relevant and you probably want to mention it, but um, I, don't, I, uh, I brought the uh, piece of paper with me so I can actually hold that up and um, make sure that where, where am I being seen there? So I've got to be looking. Am I now facing the microphone? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah, great. Okay. So if I, I, I'm going to be watching you, so that's why I'm turning around. <laughs> ah, okay. Simon, that's, that's terrific. Look forward to seeing you um, and hearing you um, in, a, in a short time. Yeah, fantastic. Okay. Lovely. Thank you. Shall I? I was just thinking, yeah. Just there. Is that all right? Yeah. That's very um, useful. Oh, you're Justin. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Hello, Justin. Jen. Can we, we can do this now? Can we do this um, it's my first visit to London in about two and a half years. Just so right right. To some of my people very close, and uh, it can feel very strange. <coughs> it? Yes, that's right. That's absolutely right. Um, so, when you finished with your. Uh, have you finished your presentation? If you don't mind, if you come and say something. I'm not to it. And then we'll have, we'll have a Q&A. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, I think we're running, despite the break, we'll have the break and then we'll have the Q&A right at the end. So, actually, it's completely up to you. Um, so we may get some questions in there. Okay. Yeah. Shall I go and round some people? Yeah, I think we just Yeah, Justin. Yeah. If you could just stand around yeah, yeah. my gym okay. stand, it'll be a good camera view. For... Yep. Okay. Yep. And see yourself in that and then too. just the. Um, oh, okay. Right. Great. Um, thanks very much. So I'm going to I'm going to get us going now. Okay. 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 Home. Are we getting rid of everything? So welcome back everyone and it's a pleasure to see uh, most people back for this afternoon's session. So we're now moving into part three on potential solutions and empowering community. And I thought this morning was 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 extremely interesting seeing uh, Philip Dunn MP here engaging in this in this kind of process. And we've also seen the need for citizen science and indeed science and the science community moving towards and embracing what we would call noisy data and sometimes uh, data that was sniffed at and then bringing that back in full circle to try to support and influence uh, positive policy making so policy making that actually addresses the concerns of the communities and that's a core aim of the environmental law foundation it's never meant to have been a political organization its key aim is to empower local communities and individuals to find the systems and the tools that help support uh, the betterment of the environment and the betterment of our health, and environmental health, and on, on top of that. So now we're moving, having heard um, in the second session about the very significant problems that, that exist around the management of environmental systems and indeed that really directly affect our water, our waterways in the UK. We're now moving into this into this third section where we start to talk to the people who've managed to move the system, who've managed to make changes, and who've started to identify the solutions to this really difficult, pernicious problem that is uh, the pollution and improper use of our waterways and indeed of our hydrology systems. So with that, I shall hand the floor over to Justin Neal from Fish Legal, who's going to talk to us about data gathering environmental information regulation requests just a moment you Af afternoon everybody uh, can you hear me okay yeah. great okay okay um can, can, can you hold it right okay. close to your mouth yeah. um I'm, I'm a solicitor at an organization called fish legal which has been going since about 1948 um we 
primarily represent anglers, but we also act in our own name. And our aim really is to protect the aquatic environment and we take legal action where we can. Just, uh, so anyone who's obviously eaten a lot of lunch ought to um, protect themselves before this next slide. Um, it's been ages trying to find a kind of punk rock photo that goes with the title. Um, the, the first, the, the starting point, I suppose, for all campaigners is, is information, um, the need to know. And the, the, the kind of campaigners cornerstone is the Aarhus Convention and the first pillar, which grants access or creates a duty for environmental bodies to um, provide environmental information for those who ask for it. So it's a kind of like a, it's a right to, to get to it. And, um, and that's kind of enshrined in the um, Environmental Information Regulations 2004, um, where there's a, it's not just providing the information, you've got to disseminate it. So it's sort of quite a positive sort of duty on the, on the public authorities. Um, but one of the, the, the key issues, I suppose, with the environmental information regulations is it, it doesn't actually uh, provide a list of what public authorities are. In other words, the people who have to provide the environmental information. What it does instead is it defines them. And there are sort of three different levels of, of definition. The first one is uh, a public authority that's pretty obvious, like a, a government department or the environment agency or NRW. Um, and the kind of middle level is where it's a, a, a body that performs functions of public administration. And the third is where the body is under the control of a public authority. So um, just to, flicking over to the next slide. Sorry, is this, is it? Um, one of the reasons that if you write to the water companies these days and ask them for information, the reason you'll be able to get it off them is because of our case in 2015, ended in 2015. But that's about a six year campaign to get the water companies to open up their files. Um, it began with um, a request to the water companies to give us the details of thousands of CSOs under what's called Dean consent, which is a kind of um, a post privatization problem where a lot of these discharges weren't regulated or controlled by conditions. And we have been campaigning to get them controlled by conditions and get the environment agency to properly permit them. Um, now, when they took that step after a long campaign, um, we needed to back up the environment agency. So we asked them for uh, the water companies for as much detail as we could, particularly United Utilities and Yorkshire Water. And they said, sorry, mate, uh, we're not covered by that. We aren't public authorities. And there began a, a long battle that lasted six years and consisted of a, a complaint to the information commissioner, a hearing at the first tier tribunal, and then moving up to the upper tribunal via the European Court of Justice, where they asked ask the question, you know, what do you need to be a public authority? And um, the, the final deciding point was that the um, a test was set by the ECJ, and that's that it has to have special powers. And we said that you know, the water companies did have these special powers. Uh, for instance, they have the power of compulsory purchase. So you know, we, we, we kind of won this great victory, which is another step forwards for us being able to see this information, which hitherto we weren't able to do directly from the water companies by right. And of course, the water companies argued that a lot of this information is available already and there are other sources for it, but it, it's very bitty and we need to be able to ask and request this information. And that's what we can now. But one of the biggest issues that we get, and it's a very personal thing, it's from Fish Legal's angle, is when we ask for information, particularly from the Environment Agency on NLW, they will put up barriers to us getting that information. And it's almost as if they're saying, well, what are you going to do about it? Um, complain to the Information Commissioner? I mean, you obviously have to go through a complaints process first with the Environment Agency, then go to the Information Commissioner, then wait for a result, and then hopefully it goes your way, which isn't that certain. But these are several of the um, sorts of barriers they do hold up. Um, most common responses we get are things like it's internal communications, and therefore it's covered by data protection, we can't release it. Um, course of justice, it's often where they're investigating a polluter and they refuse to disclose the information, even years after the pollution has taken place. I mean, even the police wouldn't do that, I think. 
Um, and then confidentiality of proceedings protected by law or confidentiality of commercial or industrial information. Um, of course, you can't rely on these if there's an emission to the environment, which is most of our cases where you've got these kinds of pollution, but it doesn't stop them from raising it from time to time. And uh, the last one is quite a good example of where the identity of the polluter never gets revealed and we're kind of stuck because the regulator isn't prosecuting and he won't give the information to us so that we can go after the polluter. So the EA will basically say the identity of the polluter is personal information. Data protection issues arise here. Um, what you could do is go to court and then ask for the information to be revealed that way through an order against the environment agency. So it's all, you know, they're putting up barriers wherever they can. And I have to say the environment agency are the ringleaders of this. Now there's a kind of parallel universe of available information that you should be able to get by rights, but it's completely separate from the environmental information regulations or the Freedom of Information Act processes. Um, so it means that if you write in to a regulator and say, can we have this information because it says in the statute that you're supposed to disclose it or make it public, and they say no, then uh, either they don't have it, which is probably quite likely, they don't have any information at all, or they do, in which case maybe a complaint, maybe you go to the um, OEP, or maybe the Ombudsman, um, or even the Judicial Review. But it's not the same process where you complain through the Environment Information Regulations, where you complain to the Information Commissioner and then beyond that. So um, there's a really good example recently. Um, my colleagues at the Salmon Trout Conservation, and uh, including Guy Lindley Adams, who I think is listening into this, uh, this address right now, um, they wrote to um, the Environment Agency and Natural Resources Wales because we're trying to get a bit more information about what sorts of permits there are for poultry farms that were mentioned by an earlier speaker in Hawaii. And um, it appeared that their information was pretty bitty, even though under the environmental um, permitting regulations, Regulation 46, are supposed to um, catalogue and record the information on these permits but they just don't. And there are big, big gaps in what the regulator actually knows about what's going on. Um, now, SNTC, that's Salmon Trout Conservation, um, got to visit their, um, their sort of information hub, which is based in Fragley, West Midlands. I don't know if anyone's been to Fragley, but uh, anyway. Um, but uh, apparently all that was there was a very old computer um, which had a very, very slow processing um, move, which didn't allow you know, the information to be revealed completely. So um, this is you know, pretty inadequate, isn't it, really? And NRW um, have almost admitted that they just don't have up-to-date information. And they're still trying to get a catalogue or backdate of information pre-2018 in their records. Um, also, the, the Water Resources Act, you just pick any of these statutes that involve the environment. There's bound to be some processes or uh, duties to publish information. And you can find a list there. And the, the Environment Act introduced a new one by um, amending the Water Industry Act. And you've also got lots of little bits of the, environment, of, of the Water Industry Act which uh, require publication of, of documents and reports and various other things. Um, there's one of the kind of sideline here which is quite important, I think, for campaigners, um, especially relating to planning and the environment, because all the, you know, even water-related development like um, new uh, sewage works would need planning permission. And in the process there, certain information is supposed to be revealed before you have committee meetings uh, under Section 100D of the Local Government Act. So they're supposed to publish this stuff days before the, the, uh, the committee meeting would take place where they decide whether or not to grant planning permission. Um, so, the, the, you know, the, the, this parallel universe of, of information requests is still there and it can be used, but it's not as useful as the environmental information regs, which are much broader. Um, I suppose this is kind of an add on here. Um, one of the biggest issues we have is that there isn't any information um, because the environment agency hasn't looked. Um, a good example of that is, you know, how do we know whether water companies are in breach of their permits? Because sometimes when they release sewage, when there's a certain volume flowing to treatment, um, 
we need to know what's going in and what's going out and subtract one to the from the other in order to see whether they're in, you know, in breach of their permits. And of course, they just don't have this information. And of course, this is what's caught out those 2000 you know, sewage treatment works that have been investigated by the Environment Agency recently. Um, there's also a, a recent move by the Environment Agency to not deal with low, what they call low level pollution, classified three to four. They can't know what the pollution is like unless they turn up, but they don't turn up anyway, so they never know. So it's a kind of circular problem. Um, so they've said in their triage that they're not going to turn up for threes and fours and they're not going to record uh, anything when someone phones up from the general public to report a pollution. We think that's disgraceful, but it's also at odds with their, their guidance. And also, the, obviously, uh, the Environment Agency's propaganda recently uh, um, with the CEO of the Environment Agency saying that uh, water, wa um, waterways of Britain are in better condition than they have been since the Industrial Revolution, which is, you know, it's just completely misleading. Another issue we come up against is the um, situations where uh, the Environment Agency is investigating for the purposes of prosecution and things go on in the background and we never find out exactly what happened, only that we're not given the information. Um, whether there's a plea, a plea bargain and say a water company pleads to a lower level of offence um, and um, it, it may include not mentioning the kind of impact on the river or other water course, so we won't know for sure how badly it's affected the water course and even that information will be kept secret. Um, enforcement undertakings um, where deals have been done to uh, accept an enforcement undertaking rather than being prosecuted. Um, again, there's a block on information. Um, the Environment Agency has a lot of discretion here because under Schedule 26 of the Environmental Permitting Regs, um, they can choose not to reveal that there's been an enforcement undertaking so the general public won't know for sure whether there has been. One. They do have records of enforcement undertakings that have been published, but not all of them have been published. So, um, and also the kind of uh, an upshot of this is, even if you do get the information, maybe a massive delay over years. So I was just trying to think very hard about whether there's any good news here, because it's supposed to be our solutions. <laughs> um, I would say, um, in defence of the water companies, maybe in, maybe in particular Dual Cymru, um, they're tending generally to be more open than the Environment Agency and NRW. Um, they're tending to be more upfront about things that have gone wrong, especially recently about the flow treatment issues. Um, and they're able to tend to own up to problems more than they have done before. And I think this is partly driven by the, the kind of public profile um, of the water companies. But I think the Environment Agency and NLW and Natural England need to step up to the plate and start being more open. Uh, as well as regulating more efficiently. Um, that's what needs to happen. I think that's it. Thanks very much, Justin. In, in the interest of time, I think we should move straight on to, to Mike Owens from Hailing Sewage Watch, who's going to be talking about, to a citizen, talking about citizen science in the community. Over to you, Mike. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah I'm just Mike here from the main source bridge. I hear people talking. Are we ready? Yes, Mike, we, we can see the slides and uh, we're, we're ready. We can hear you very well. So, um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a firefighter and not a scientist. I'm just a humble windsurfer, paddleboarder, kayaker with around 40 years experience of being in the water. Over that time, I've endured life threatening hospitalisation, several infections per year, every year, and even surgeries as a direct result of sewage pollution. I've just been doing what I can to make a difference with the limited skill set that I have. I would like to share with you how Hailing Sewage Watch has campaigned to help for change through the use of some very basic citizen science. 
You'll find much of what I've done here is not particularly scientifically watertight, but I make no apologies because it has yielded the successes I set out to achieve. Such success would never have been possible had I taken a more robust approach, in my opinion. I hope this snapshot of my humble efforts will, will be helpful, perhaps even motivating for other citizens. Slide, please. So when I see uh, websites like this guaranteeing water quality at my at my local beach, I find that really annoying. Um, it roars me to see this kind of stuff. Um, guarantees are, are simply not possible without real time monitoring um, and statistical manipulation of just five to 20 samples every 365 days cannot guarantee your water quality right here, right now. Hailings Beaches is expected to receive around 1 million visitors every summer season. And that's an awful lot of people to be misinformed and misled. Uh, next slide, please. So what is citizen science? Well, it's probably not what I'm doing, but um, you can see uh, some, um, some definitions there. Uh, most definitions I have read relate to the citizen collaborating and or contributing in scientific projects designed by professional scientists. My definition was a little bit different, but definitely includes these three aspects. In the beginning, there was little interest in sewage pollution locally. Only those suffering sickness and infection from being in the water were being motivated to do anything. Initially, I did try to find academic assistance from local universities, but there was no real interest. So I formulated my own hypothesis that is that stormwater discharges were dumping raw sewage effluent containing fecal pathogens directly into my recreational waters. And that was a direct consequence of rainfall. Some people argue that citizen observations need to be scientifically robust to be heard. Whilst on the face of that, it sounds reasonable, but at grassroots level, I found this not to be necessarily true. It's best to do something rather than strive for a regime that will stand up in court because you would actually never get start testing. So that's that's my view anyway. I set out to collect samples and other data to put my hypothesis to the test and also to challenge polluters and regulators to refute the data. Uh, and there have been some success. My presentation of sample results were almost certainly technically flawed in the beginning, and I make no apology for that either. But raw data was sufficient for public awareness to get the changes I wanted to see. As I learned more about what was going on, my arguments started to become more cogent and everyone started to listen, which is a good thing. Next slide. So is citizen science actually required? I, th I think uh, the Environment Audit Committee's report recognises that, that is absolutely uh, a yes. They could be doing a lot more regulating and a lot more monitoring in short, it appears that the Environment Agency are underperforming. Self-policing is not working either. Water companies are required to record effluent flow data from their sewage works 24-7 every 15 minutes. But the EA doesn't seem to be using this detailed data for their regulation purposes. More on this later. Next slide, please. I tried to limit the, um, the sources for my information because I was as a, a lone bandit, as it were, I'm, I was completely overwhelmed by how much data there is. So this this is the list that I've used. It's not an exhaustive list, but it's a, a pretty good start. Next slide, please. So the first thing I did was uh, a sampling, um, which was crowdfunded from Hailing Surge Watch, um, and the samples were about twenty five pounds each. Um, if the lab isn't local, transportation cost is also going to be a problem uh, for some. Our lab didn't work at weekends, so premium pricing was also a problem which we couldn't actually overcome through the finances of our, our bank. So that is another problem. Next slide, please. So other people, other groups that have sprung up around the, the South Coast in particular are, are struggling to find lab facilities and that, that's that's just a problem that we have to go around. But um, samples had to be at the lab before 3 p.m. on a Friday in order to be registered. 
and our sampling regime was limited to just five days out of the seven, which was a bit frustrating at times. Samples were required to be kept in the dark to avoid UV interference. Samples were also required to be submitted for analysis within 24 hours. If samples could not be transported immediately, then they needed to be refrigerated. Next slide, please. We sampled at exactly the same location as the Environment Agency's bathing water sampling site and used their defined process to collect, store and transport samples to the lab. I think it was important we needed to ensure our lab, sorry, our sampling was beyond accusations of ineptitude. Timing was often challenging. We often got it wrong drawing clean samples, which is obviously discouraging, un unlike rivers where flows are much more easily defined between two points. The complexity of harbour tidal flows within complicated topography is made predicting the movement of contamination. Very difficult indeed. Next slide, please. Um, just a quick one about sampler safety. Uh, we're, we're actually uh, faced the English Channel in the open sea, so I collected most of the samples myself. Uh, as a windsurfer, used to high winds and large waves, sampling was often particularly challenging and uh, on occasion downright scary and dangerous. I, I was confident facing six to eight feet breaking waves to get that sample, but others were, were not so keen, so not for the faint hearted. Next slide, please. So this is uh, uh, the um, report from one of the samples. And it's it's basically a bathing water directive sample, uh, which you can see here. Um, bathing water classification calculations are really complex and have a, a myriad of caveats and intricacies. The fact is, though, that some samples were so filthy, the technicalities surrounding percentiles, etc., made little difference to my overall message. So I actually ignored them. Limitations on funding, lab availability, transportation and technical, particularly tidal expertise, meant that I could never conduct a scientifically and mathematically robust testing regime anyway. Nevertheless, the results were sufficiently good enough for public awareness purposes. It's worth mentioning that no authority has ever questioned the validity of my sampling arrangements. Next slide. I set out to challenge and discredit the concept that our bathing water's excellent classification meant excellent water quality. With typically up to 20 samples per year, it was never designed to be an accurate indicator of the current water quality. But that is how classifications are being universally and unacceptably communicated by councils, MPs, water companies and the Environment Agency. I also wanted to highlight the water quality is actually unknown at any time because of the time taken for lab analysis, which in our case is about seven days. Frankly, being told several days after filthy water has been sampled is at best unhelpful. This particular sample was taken on a blue flag beach in the middle of the official bathing season with families and people doing water sports in the sea. And as you can see, it's nearly double what it should be on a blue flag beach in the summertime. Next slide, please. So I found uh, rainfall quite an interesting um, thing to try and predict um, discharges. Um, I actually measure it in my backyard as well. So yeah, that's that's one that's quite good for predicting water, uh, stormwater discharges. Next slide, please. We've heard about uh, EIR um, regulations and uh, what I have done, although it's uh, still a work in progress, I've used uh, my rights uh, for that data to try and build a picture of how the local sewage network works, which is particularly complicated around Hailing Island where I live. Environment agency permits are also available, although sometimes far too difficult to uh, acquire in my, in my view. On-site treatment plant visits are also a good way of accessing information if you uh, research your questions before you go. Next slide, please. So round here, um, some local authorities are still measuring the seawater in the harbours um, and you can get those through freedom of information requests um, and they're available online too, mostly. Disappointing, my local council stopped testing in 2015 
uh, which I can only assume as a, a cost saving exercise. Next slide, please. So there's a, a video I'd like to show you here. Um, it is of a a, a, um, a long seat outfall. Is it going to start? Ooh. <laughs> OK, here we go then. So this is quite interesting. Um, this kind of content is not advertised by water companies. Persistent researching uncovered many such models from Southern Water. These models are typically demanded by the Environment Agency following a pollution incident. So it's definitely worth asking your local water company. Specifically regarding this movie, the EA and the Southern Water say that this long sea outfall does not affect any bathing water at all in the area. This hydrodynamic model uses typical E. coli decay times in seawater, tidal wind and other data to show the impact of discharge. This particular discharge is stormwater. It's relatively short discharge. And as you can see, um, in a few seconds time, all of that uh, pollution, which is not going to affect our bathing water, gets sucked into the harbour to the right of Hailing Island, if I haven't got a mouse, there it goes, and across every single bathing water in the area. So we also have um, failing kelp beds in the area and lobster fisheries in the uh, influence of this outfall. We can stop that video now, please. For interest, that same outfall also routinely discharges 109 million litres of treated effluent from, from around 400,000 toilet users daily. Um, next slide, please. That's number 16. So um, EOAR requests mandate a response within 20 days, and this can be extended to 40 days in exceptional circumstances. As a frequent requester deemed to be a thorn in the side of of Southern Water, I believe I'm possibly being targeted for unusually slow responses. Indeed, for the information you can see here, um, Southern Water took 318 days, 318 days to give me the data I asked for. So persistence is definitely required. I suspected that the water company clearly knew the data would be damning, and they tried every trick in the book to make sure I didn't see it. Professor Hammond, who you, Peter Hammond, who you might be familiar with, kindly analysed this data that I got and found that there are 329 non-compliant discharges uh, between the dates shown. The Environment Agency would not have detected these breaches if they only examined data summarised over 12 or 24 hours, which is typical. This approach tends to camouflage permit breaches through mathematical averaging. I believe this uh, data uniquely challenges the Environment Agency's regulatory role. Next slide, please. Um, some of you may be familiar with charts that look like this. This is one of Professor Hammond's uh, charts. Um, and basically what it, it says is that the black line, the horizontal black lines over the red, shows when there have been non-compliant discharges. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's given it large there. Um, top tip, uh, public available data available to the citizen scientists, as we have seen, can lead to the creation of some very powerful com composite data sets by experts. You just need to find experts willing to help. Next slide, please. So some of the outcomes. Um, Southern Water has invested in a, a near real-time discharge warning system, first proposed by me in 2018 at a chance meeting with one of their PR people. It's not perfect yet, but I have a seat at the table to influence future improvements. This particular screenshot shows bathing waters have suffered a feces laden storm to discharge in the last 24 hours following rainfall. In the harbours around Hailing, CSOs, that's just two of these red dots, cumulatively discharged um, sewage for 102 days. Next slide, please. 
uh, some more success. More recently, uh, People Power has been responsible for real-time E. coli pollution monitoring for Haley's Blue Flag Beach. This device will be integrated into the, uh, uh, the Beach Boy Discharge Service that you just saw on the previous slide. I think none of these initiatives would have been happened without citizen science and people power demanding change. That's a good thing. Next slide, please. So awareness has been a big part of my personal campaign about this, and it's led to significant interest uh, from the press and elsewhere about what we're doing. It's led to MPs creating forums, meetings with uh, the sewage undertakers, CEOs, ministers. It's led to funding by Southern Water for environmental groups and additional EA bathing water testing on, on Hailing Island. I believe it's been the main driver for more investment in Southern Water's largest treatment works uh, for increased stormwater tanks that reduces stormwater discharges. Next slide, please. So um, Philip Dunn's um, wonderful Environment Audit Committee, I can see the quote there. Um, I'm really grateful to, for that report that recognises and makes recommendations on the future role of citizen science. I'm also grateful that it recommends more transparency and timeliness regarding water industry serving public requests for information, which is really, really bad, as, you've, as you have seen. Next slide, please. We've got another video for you, which you may or may not have recognised. We're nearly done. So in the 21st century and with social media, public domain content is essential for raising awareness, for recruiting help for your citizen science projects and for finding expert help. I'm sure most of you have seen this content. It was viewed several million times. Video footage like this is gold dust and with good light and a low wind, you too can highlight what's going on in your area and drive support for local science projects. OK, uh, and for the last slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I reckon I've got about 60 seconds left, hopefully. So I'm going to leave you with this new initiative. Um, it's much more aligned with the classic attributes of a citizen science project I mentioned earlier. I co-founded the partnership in 2021 to find out what's really in the water. We are working closely with two universities on this, a data-driven organisation to scientifically investigate, raise general awareness and encourage change wherever it's needed. All data we collect will be made publicly available. And our starting point is Project Spudlight, where local communities are funding it to the tune of about 30K. It actually started executing last month. And working with academic experts at Brunel and Portsmouth Universities, we are testing 10 individual samples of five marine species. And we're doing biopsies looking at 200 chemicals in their digestive systems known to be present in sewage effluent. And those um, spe specimens are being examined in Sweden right now. Um, next week, we are starting our testing at around 20 locations for five concurrent days to find a baseline of the same 200 chemicals known to be in sewage effluent. And we're also looking to test the eDNA baseline for our harbours as well. All the results are out in two to three months. If you want to go and have a look, the website is there. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention.
don't know what's happening. Did I break it? <laughs> we seem to have lost administration, huh? It was a very interesting talk, though. I'm just sitting here listening. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for getting out there on those waves. That sounds like it was pretty impressive. Stephen? Hello, can you hear me? Ah, yes, we, we, we can hear you. Are, are you. are you going to share slides or are you talking from... No, I'm going to talk. Going to talk. You've got a briefing paper. Which we have yes. You've got a briefing... Yes, we you've got a briefing paper which we've sent you and uh, we would refer all uh, participants to have a look at that. Um, if you've not received a copy, we can send you one. You get it by contacting me, Stephen, with a PH, dot marinette, M-A-R-I-N-E-T, at btinternet.com. Marinette is a voluntary campaigning organization on uh, marine issues primarily, but also on rivers because they all flow into the sea. And uh, we're going to talk about reviving uh, the UK waters, of course, which is the title. And I've got with me here in the bottom left hand corner of your screen, David Levy, who's the chair of Marinette. Uh, we've been involved with the passage of the Environment Act, which has featured fairly central stage in all of this. And the reality is that if you are expecting the Environmental Act to solve the problems for you, the answer is no, it won't. And we'll come to the reasons why for that in a moment. Um, Central to that is the fact that the government and DEFRA have been totally disinterested in these issues for a very long period of time. And when the government is disinterested, nothing, nothing much happens and the polluters are allowed to do very much as they want to. And the polluters in this particular case are the water companies and as we've seen they're pretty dysfunctional and unless some proper regulation comes into effect they will remain dysfunctional. Uh, having uh, said that you should be aware that when classifying a river for its pollution level the Environment Agency uses a metric called reasons for non-ecological, non-good ecological status. And 35% uh, of those reasons come from the water companies, sewage treatment works. And over 50% come from agriculture. So as you can see, agriculture is a very strong influence in all of this. And uh, if you're going to revive UK waters, uh, waterways, then you've got to bite the bullet there as much as you are in the case of sewage treatment works. Uh, I don't think we will have a great deal of time available to us to uh, talk about the agricultural side because it's not featured in the Environment Act, but let me emphasize how important that is. And it's particularly uh, due in a lot of cases to intensive livestock farming and not just uh, chemical arable agriculture. David, do you want to say anything at this point? Yes, yeah, so I think I would like to raise with you the uh, selective memory of the politicians with regard to the passage of the bill. Um, it was mentioned this morning that, uh, you know, Rebecca Powell, the Minister of State for DEFRA, was supportive. In fact, the, it, was an, it wasn't only when the bill went to the House of Lords 
and there was very active campaigning by groups like ourselves um, in the Lords to get um, amendments laid down on the bill. And that went back to the um, House of Commons for um, another reading. Um, we found opposition all the way through from DEFRA, from the politicians, and even the NGO movements as well. And that's a really sad thing to say. And it's been our um, assessment that the NGOs have been bought off by charitable status. If you get charitable status, you're not allowed to actually speak um, against government policy. That is one of the rules that's laid down. So you've got all of the major NGOs are registered charities, and therefore, what have they been doing? And the answer is very little. Voices like the last two speakers, I have to say, are very refreshing, very refreshing indeed, because one, when you get involved with these situations, which Marinette has been involved with water quality for well over 20 years, and we've just seen repeated governments, repeated politicians, repeated failures by the Environment Agency. And to a certain extent, I have sympathy for them because their budget has been cut by two thirds over the last 10 years. So how the hell can they do a proper job when they don't have adequate funding? We then have in this bill, which is now an act, the Environment Act, we now have the Office of Environmental Protection. What are its responsibilities? What will it do? The government haven't got a clue. It hasn't really come out and told us what they will do in this new department. And was it the cutback in the Environment Agency's budget that funded this new organization? And why was that so? I, I do note from this conference today that we didn't have any member from any water company and we didn't have any member from the um, Environment Agency or DEFRA attending. These were the people that you really need to ask questions of. So that's my little input there. Right, well, well in the uh, short amount of time left uh, to us, uh, just let's have a quick look at what the Environment Act 2021 is meant to be offering us to get on top of this problem. There are five clauses, uh, 79 to 84. If you take clause 79, the water companies are going to have to produce uh, drainage and sewerage management plans. Uh, and these will be submitted to the Secretary of State and reviewed once every five years. However, as you've seen in earlier presentations, one of the principal causes of storm overflows and the pollution is the fact that there isn't separate surface water drainage. And these sewerage management plans will not be addressing that question. So there's a fundamental weakness there. And when they are being asked to address relevant environmental risks in these plans, there is no definition of what a relevant environmental risk is. That is left totally to the discretion of the Secretary of State. When you come to the next clause, 80, the Secretary of State has got to prepare a plan for reducing the discharges of sewerage from storm overflows. And the Secretary of State's got to produce this by the 1st of September of this year. Uh, we'll issue a progress report in three years and thereafter every five years. The water companies also under this clause have to produce an annual storm overflows report and the Environment Agency likewise. 
Now, at the moment, the water companies are producing an annual report, but it's very much out of date, of course. It, it occurs uh, several months after the previous year, and there is no requirement under this clause for them to produce interim data, i.e. monthly, so that we can keep a close tab on what is going on. As far as the Environment Agency's annual report, public disclosure of that is at the Environment Agency's discretion. The next clause, reporting on discharges from all storm overflows, that is to say, letting the public know within one hour of a storm overflow commencing and ceasing, the water company has to make this information public. And this is one of the loudly trumpeted gains of the act. Um, however, when you actually read the detail of the clause, this requirement requires secondary legislation, i.e. further legislation to go to Parliament before it becomes operative. And there is no date set for when that secondary legislation must be presented to Parliament. And you must know here that this secondary legislation is at the bequest of the government. So what one has seen in the past is that this secondary le legislation can be delayed for up to a decade. It's happened in the past. It could happen here. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next uh, clause is the monitoring of the quality of water affected by the discharges and the water companies under this clause must continuously monitor water quality. But uh, once again, there's uh, no public declaration of, of this by the water companies. And once again, it requires secondary legislation before it becomes a legal obligation with no date set for this secondary legislation. So that, that clause is, is there, but it's not working and no one knows when it will. The uh, clause that we managed to get inserted into the bill through the huge effort of the Duke of Wellington and other peers is clause 83, and that requires a reduction of adverse impacts. Stephen, sorry, just to let you know, you have two minutes left. Thank you. Right, we'll uh, take thirty seconds. Uh, so that's there uh, in 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 the act now, but uh, it requires. There's no definition of progressive reduction because Parliament wouldn't allow a definition. And then there's a report on the elimination. This is clause eighty four. A report on the elimination of discharges from storm overflows. Uh, that's essentially the cost of them. And uh, that's a, a key document. It's already actually been published. It's the storm overflows report. You'll see more details in the briefing we prepared. I would go into that more now, but alas, time forbids. Thank you. Stephen and, and David. Um, so now we'll move uh, straight on to uh, Sally Ashby's presentation on bylaws, the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, and marine rew rewilding for climate conservation and communities. This is a pre recorded presentation, but Sally is also online. So um, over to you, Liam. So well, over to Sally, but uh, Liam will start the presentation. Hi, everyone, and thank you for asking me to present today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, um, which is an ambitious and pioneering nature-based solution to restore our coastal ecosystems for biodiversity, communities and climate. 
Uh, Nature-based solutions um, have been defined by the IUCN as actions to protect, sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems in ways that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively to provide both human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So where the story began really with the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project is with the Sussex IFCA. The IFCAs are the inshore fisheries and conservation authorities. They were established in 2010 and their duties defined in the Marine and Coastal Access Act. Um, and so the Sussex Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority has um, the duty to sustainably manage the fisheries in the um, shore in within the, the six nautical miles um, of their seaward jurisdiction, as shown here, which extends from Chichester Harbour in the west to Rye Bay in the east and extending out to sea six nautical miles. And so what occurred um, in terms of the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project was one of the first things that um, the Sussex IFCA were to do to, to sort of build their evidence base and um, understand the seabed more was this habitat mapping. So extensive ha habitat mapping of the seabed uh, within the district. And as a result of that, um, what became evident was a, a really significant loss in certain critical ecosystems and one in particular. And so they proposed a nearshore trawling bylaw or management measure to exclude trawling from uh, Chichester all the way to Rye Bay, um, extending out one kilometre for the majority of that, but in one particular area, which you'll see here between Selsey and Shoreham, the trawler excluding exclusion zone was proposed to extend out four kilometres. And so why, why was this proposed? And one of the key habitats that um, was um, part of this, this bylaw was kelp. So kelp is a large brown seaweed and it forms, it's aggregate forming, so it, it forms beds or dense areas, often referred to as forests, um, which provide critical habitat, um, not only to fish for fisheries, for juvenile fish, nursery habitats, but actually the kelp themselves from uh, the base, the holdfast that attaches to, to the hard substrate, the rock, to, through to the stipe, the stem, to the fronds, all of these areas provide sort of niche habitats um, for the smaller creatures. And then um, ultimately this supports the whole trophic range. So the full sort of um, food web within the ecosystem. So this sort of complex 3D structure creates these habitats that supports a huge amount of biodiversity but also critically uh, critical essential fish habitat. Um, and so the IFCA in their mapping of, of the seabed, but also in their, their building up of evidence, what became clear, and this is an old map from a council document um, talking about, uh, about the seaweed. Um, in this instance, it was talking about the seaweed washing up on the beach. Um, but what became clear was that actually there were these very dense, extensive kelp beds that extended almost 40 kilometers along the coast from Selsey through to Shoreham. And um, with the habitat mapping that the Sussex IFCA were doing, what became really clear was the extent of the loss of this critical habitat. So we've lost actually 96% uh, of these former historic kelp beds. And so the nearshore trawling bylaw uh, that the Sussex Inco proposed um, became uh, very much um, in the public eye and garnered huge amounts of public support thanks to um, something called the Help Our Kelp campaign. So 
in the in the process of the Sussex SIFCA um, going through their formal consultation for a bylaw uh, to exclude the trawling, um, Big Wave Productions produced a, a campaign film narrated and supported by Sir David Attenborough, and um, with also with campaign sort of support from the Sussex Wildlife Trust, the Marine Conservation Society, and Blue Marine Foundation, and this really highlighted the importance of kelp and it really captured the public imagination and so this coincided with the um the formal consultation by the sussex ifca uh with the bylaw which was then agreed um and sent off to the secretary of state and the bylaw actually um, thanks to the to the public support gained through the Help Our Kelp campaign, that bylaw went to Westminster with over 2,000 signatories, which is really sort of unheard of with a with a fisheries bylaw. Um, so as a result um, of all the support for the bylaw and and the work of the Sussex IFCA, um, in in March 2021 that bylaw was signed off, was passed, and, and the Sussex IFCA were able then to enforce the trawler exclusion zone. And that um, prompted the, the formation of the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project. And really, the key to all of this, the work by the Sussex IFCA and ongoing work, is about taking this ecosystem approach about um, how we can manage and protect our natural capital assets for the benefit of society and for nature. Um, and obviously, kelps, kelp forests particularly are, are emblematic of that and, and really um, highlight how important these ecosystems are because they do provide these vital nursery grounds for the fisheries, this crucial habitat that supports a whole host of different species and biodiversity. And also what's becoming even more apparent in terms of with the climate crisis is just how critical these blue carbon habitats are. So um, our many coastal ecosystems, so salt marshes, seagrasses and kelp forests um, really are critical in, in drawing down carbon um, from the atmosphere. Um, kelp obviously um, is different to salt marsh and seagrass in that it grows on, on rock, it, it, so it doesn't store the carbon directly into sediments or soil, but transfers a lot of that carbon into other adjacent ecosystems, into the deeper sea habitats and sediments. So we're actually conducting a lot of research already into the role of carbon, um, the role of kelp in the carbon cycle, blue carbon cycle. But ultimately, thanks to the National Trawling Bylaw and the protection, the exclusion of the trawling, there's, there's this potential now for rewilding our seas for, in Sussex, for, for allowing the seabed to recover and restore and support that, that whole trophic range of species. And so, fantastically, with the bylaw in place, and now we've had um, a whole year of doing baseline research, of, of, of establishing what change is occurring as a result of this nearshore trawling bylaw. Um, so once that bylaw was passed, we formed the Sussex Kelp Restoration Project, so a collaboration of organisations from NGOs to academic institutes and local authorities like um, Ada and Worthing and the Sussex IFCA. And so really our, our first year has been about establishing a baseline um, to then map and monitor the change that occurs as a result of removing this, this um, impact, this, this trawling impact. So a whole host of, of, of tiers of monitoring from satellite images to multi-beam acoustic surveys to towed videos and um, baited uh, remote underwater videos monitoring the fish biodiversity. We're doing work with genetics, um, not only just understanding the genetics of the kelp that's there, but also eDNA analysis to establish sort of biodiversity baselines. And um, and all of this this research, you know, feeding into that evidence base of of what change is occurring. And um, and this is uh, a photograph um, from one of our, our um, 
key community groups that are that are championing the kelp and raising awareness called Sussex Underwater. And um, and they went out just this weekend to um, have a look at the kelp um, that is that is regenerating in Bognor. So this is um, you know gives you an indication of some of the fantastic areas of kelp we do have. So at the heart of our project are the communities um, that are directly impacted by um, that have been directly impacted by the trawling but also by other issues. And one of the big issues that is coming to the fore as a result of our stakeholder engagement is um, uh, water quality issues, and um, particular sedimentation issues amongst the fishing community, particularly in relation to the lobster and crab fishery, but also, for example, our free diving community, scuba divers. Um, there's a real noticeable um, impact that, that that sedimentation is having um, on in the near shore and there's real concern around that as well as obviously issues around pollution uh, sewage um, and water quality generally so we're working really closely with with our communities in terms of building up the ability to report incidents to feed into um, a kind of database of, of, of monitoring and we've we've um, recently conducted a, a sedimentation survey we've also conducted a workshop and this just gives you a sense of the number of different stakeholders involved in in for example these sedimentation workshops and um, and really bringing everyone together to work towards solutions and to work towards affecting change in terms of can we mitigate um, against sedimentation, particularly in relation to dredge spoil dumping um, and aggregates. So, so we are looking into these issues um, and really making sure that, that community groups can uh, have a voice, have a seat at the table and um, work towards solutions. And really, the um, the appetite to be involved, um, the 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 enthusiasm and the passion has been is really evident within our our stakeholder community, and um, and really summed up um, by this quote because um, we really can't do this alone, you know, or working in silos. We all have to come together, particularly in the marine environment, um, where it's it's so sort of dynamic and complex. Um, and equally linking in with the land and a lot of what we're looking at now is relating to land management, you know, around sedimentation. So, so there's a lot of work still to be done, um, but we're very optimistic and enthusiastic and it's um, been a pleasure to talk about it. So thank you for having me. <coughs> So, uh, thank you very much, Sally, and, and, and wonderful to see the, the fruits of all your efforts. As, as a scientist, obviously, I'm very keen on understanding the data gathering and the baseline work that you've done. And so, great to see the work built on, on, on an evidence base. Um, <clears throat> so, now we, we'll, we'll move on to our next presentation. We have Claire Robertson from Oxford Rivers Project uh, on the bathing waters, on bathing water status. So, over to you, Claire. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, is there a way I can share my screen rather than sharing the slides so in advance? Because they're, uh, they're the more um, relevant ones that I've got. Yes, you should, you should be able to. You, you can see a, a square at the top with a little upward arrow and the bottom of the screen. Um, uh, it says only meeting all the most can share, so I don't think I'm in. Uh, we're, just, we're just going to enable you so that you can, uh, so that you can present yours. Thank you. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly whilst we are. Um, I'm Claire, I'm the Oxford Rivers Project Officer and the founder of a group called End Sewage Pollution Mid Thames. Um, our group is almost totally run by volunteers. Um, we last year we had one paid member of staff for two days a week, which was myself, but now I'm back to being a full-time PhD student and we contracted some people from the Rivers Trust but we are a community-led, um, almost totally volunteer-led led group. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much for having me at um, 
this uh thank you for having me at this event it's been really fascinating um heartening also worrying um but yes it's been great to get that sort of national overview of what's what's going on with our rivers and waterways hopefully that should be starting to share now here we go uh, so we've heard a lot about the problem um locally near oxford um, in 2020, which is the most recent uh, up-to-date data we have, uh, there were 50,000 hours of storm water overflows um, just between the source of the Thames and Dorchester on Thames, uh, which is equivalent to each sewage treatment works discharging for 20 days of the year continuously. And a recent report looking at those 104 sewage treatment works found that a third of them discharge more than 1,000 hours a year and half of them over 500 hours a year, and that almost half of them don't have capacity to meet current um, demand, current uh, dry flow times three demand. Um, <clears throat> what happened was in 2020, I mean, as well as being a PhD student, um, I'm a local to Oxford, um, I'm a river swimmer, um, as are many people in Oxford, and there's many more who um, use the waterways for recreation. Obviously, the tourist punting and the university rowing clubs you'll probably have in your head, but there's also many different water sports groups um, and an angling community as well. And so when the news broke about uh, the frequency of raw sewage discharges, uh, we organised a protest, um, thought it was going to be just myself and um, our group of friends, but we had a, about 100 people turning up at our floating protest. And off the back of that, um, I met a city councillor in the river <laughs> um, and she had heard about uh, bathing water status, um, which I didn't know anything about a couple of years ago. Uh, but she thought we should apply for it for Oxford. Um, I started researching it. We set up a petition for with three demands, um, designated bathing water status on the Thames in Oxford, uh, real-time alerts of when raw sewage discharges are happening and upgrades to wastewater treatment works locally. And that rapidly got over 5,000 signatures and the city council uh, voted unanimously in favour. So on the back of that, we met with the CEO of Thames Water, um, Sarah Bentley. And to our surprise, they said yes to most of our uh, requests or demands and they said that they would support us to do um, some water quality testing for bacteria and also work to provide real-time alerts of sewage spills from six locations in and around Oxford um, and the organisations at the top all contributed funding and time to help us run this project and also put forward the bathing water status application. So starting with the bathing water status application, um, what is bathing water status? I mean, we've heard quite a lot about it already today. We've heard uh, people saying it isn't a solution or it is. I think it's um, in contention at the moment whether it can or can't be. But essentially what it is, is a place where a large number of people bathe and it has facilities for bathing. Um, it's sampled, water is sampled up to 20 times only in the bathing season, which is between mid-May and the end of September, for two different species of bacteria, E. coli and intestinal enterococci, which are faecal indicator organisms. So they indicate that there's poo in the water. You don't know whose poo, it could be human poo or um, livestock related poo. And depending on the levels of those bacteria, that's what the image at the top shows, um, that determines what designation the location is given. Signage is displayed um, at the site of that designation as well. If a bathing water is classed as poor um, and insufficient for bathing, it has five years to achieve at least sufficient status before being de-designated. Um, the UK has over 600 bathing waters, but they're almost all coastal. There's 16 lakes and there's only one river site currently, the River Wharf in Ilkley. Um, this is compared to European countries France has over 500 rivers designated, and the other countries there have, have more, than, more than we have designated. Um, some many NGO groups think that bathing water status is a solution to uh, water quality problems. 
uh, pointing to data that since uh, bathing waters have been designated in the 1990s, uh, the quality of those bathing waters have, have improved significantly. Um, so they hope that the same can happen if we have rivers designated. But aside from that, um, Oxford is a very you know, popular area of river use, as I've said before, and local people wanted more information on the quality of the water. So our application, um, there are actually several different areas people swim, but we applied for Port Meadow, uh, which is a historic area of common land, so north and west of the city centre. Uh, it's also a triple SI and a special area of conservation. Um, essentially to apply for bathing water status, you just need count data of the number of users over 20 days in the bathing season. So it's really quite a simple application process um, and you need landowner permission. This is uh, city council land, so that was relatively easy. <coughs> you also need to go through a consultation process, uh, both a local consultation and a national consultation. This has all been quite lengthy um, and we just, the national consultation closed at the beginning of this month and we're waiting a decision any day now, really. And we're hopeful that we'll have the second uh, bathing water river in the country. And as you can see, over 2,000 people um, will use just um, will use Port Meadow. Um, these counts are only done in 10 minutes, so they're really a spot count um, on sunny, sunny days in the summer. Um, other things we've we've achieved, we managed to get these sewage spill alerts from six locations. Um, that, that was a, a bit of a difficult process. We had times when the alert system uh, mysteriously broke or the emails weren't working or that sort of thing. So there was sort of mistrust that built up there between the community and Thames Water. Um, but through this campaigning, uh, we hope that that um, added to the pressure on the Environment Bill. Uh, one of the new provisions is that sewage um, companies must mm -hmm. provide that real-time information within an hour, I believe, of all discharges. And Thames Water now um, have a promise to provide alerts from all of their CSOs uh, by the end of this year. So we need to push to hold them to that. We also uh, did some citizen science water quality testing for um, the bathing water bacteria, E. coli and enterococci. Um, we believe this is probably the longest study of its kind in the country. Well, some, one of the largest data sets on bacteria in rivers um, because it hasn't, as far as we're aware, and as others have mentioned, it's quite hard to find data from the Environment Agency and get it. But, but as far as we're aware, it hasn't really been monitored in rivers because none of them have been bathing water, designated as bathing waters. Um, you can't test for bacteria. Uh, well, there is some technology now coming through to enable you to test for bacteria in real time. But as I think the speaker from Hailing Sewage Watch mentioned, um, you, it's uh, usually a 24 hour lag to get the results. Um, and in terms of labs, Thames Water actually let us use their labs, which are independently accredited. But we had volunteers in the picture here going out collecting those samples using proper aseptic technique. Um, and we tested every week. Um, and the water quality results are posted on our website um, and they're there for anyone to access, anyone to use and interpret. Um, we had an interim report come out last September and uh, the full report on our results should be coming out um, again next month or by the end of this month. So this is a map showing the locations. The pink circles are some popular bathing spots in the city, um, but we looked at all the tributaries as well. Um, and yeah, it's called the Oxford Rivers Project because the Thames isn't the only river in Oxford. There's also the Charwell upriver. We have the Evenlode, the Windrush, and there's many different sort of streams and distributaries that go through Oxford. Um, and essentially looking at the two species of bacteria, looking at them upstream and downstream with sewage treatment works on each tributary, um, we believe we can start to make a conclusion of the, the sources of pollution of our, of our bathing areas. Um, and the ratio of E. coli to enterococci uh, can start to tell you um, whether the pollution is 
sewage linked or um, agriculture linked. And this is due, due to the, the um, how long um, the different bacteria are viable. So uh, E. coli um, die off much more quickly in the water column than or um, on land than enterococci. Um, so if you have a, a higher ratio of enterococci than to E. coli, that does indicate that the, the that poo has actually been washed over land rather than going straight from say a sewage treatment works into the river. Um, our results, um, yes, all four of the swimming sites we looked at would be classed as poor under current regulations, but there was a lot of variety in the data, including in drier months, um, levels being much, uh, of bacteria being much lower, even at good to excellent levels, whereas in wetter months, um, leaping up to two or three times the safe level of bacteria. The ratios of the two species, um, the scientist who's analysing the data concludes that um, in, the, in the swimming locations, sewage is the main culprit. Um, this is disputed by Thames Water, who claim that, um, well, they, they want more uh, detailed data on the source of, of that pollution, um, which is a, a study we're looking into different ways to fund and, and research. Uh, potential is um, using DNA, uh, environmental DNA, to actually sequence the bacteria in the water samples. Um, there's also the potential of using real-time sensors um, uh, and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, in the wider catchment, we see more agricultural um, input. Um, there's some really shockingly high bacteria levels, one uh, downstream of a... So all, all of our samples are, are far enough downstream of sewage treatment works that they're not in the, the mixing zone, so-called mixing zone. You're not sampling directly from the outfall. Um, you're sampling once the, the effluent has actually mixed with the normal river water. But still, in one of our sample sites, uh, we regularly had E. coli levels 100 times the safe bathing level. This isn't a bathing water spot, but it just shows um, how high uh, sewage pollution is in some of our waterways. And only one out of the 18 sites would pass um, bathing water standards if they were judged against them. I'm going to skip over this bit. That was really about river use. Um, where next? We hope that our bathing water, we will achieve bathing water designation, and that will actually uh, bring pressure to bear on Thames Water to investigate and research um, further and invest further in sewage treatment works um, upstream of these bathing water areas. Um, Cassington Sewage Treatment Works is one of the ones we are, we've got our eye on. Um, we didn't have any spill alerts from there all of 2021 compared to 2020 when there were several uh, sewage spills recorded. When we queried this with Thames Water, they said that they managed to achieve a 20% capacity increase uh, seemingly overnight. So that's um, you know, rather suspicious and we want to do more work to actually look at the water quality in between that treatment works and the popular bathing sites and to try and pinpoint the real sources of that. But I think there is a risk, as others have said, of getting caught up in proving, 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 monitoring and all, a lot of that being put on citizens uh, when the Environment Agency, the regulator, should be the ones doing this monitoring and bringing prosecutions. Um, so we mustn't deflect from that. Um, obviously, there needs to be massive investment in, in sewage treatment to make it fit for the 21st century, for our current population, for future population, and for the challenges of climate change. Um, so hopefully, if I come back in five years' time, we'll have cleaner rivers in Oxford. Um, thank you very much for having me. Claire, and, and, and thanks for ending on that point about the role of the environment agency and maybe the regulators in uh, in managing our water. Um, we, we're uh, as you can see, we've we've overrun our time, and so without the head off for a fifteen. Uh,
we said a 10 minute break, so we should be back here by 20 to 4 um, after the after a coffee. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for this first part of the session. We'll come back and have a QA after two talks in the following session following the, the tea and coffee break. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.
I'll just stand here and redirect the camera. <laughs> Seven balls in its house, and half. I said, Oh, no, 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 you, you got the lion there. So welcome back after the coffee, everyone, and, and hopefully we uh, we've still got everyone online as well. Um, so welcome back for the for the final session this afternoon. We, we have a couple of a couple of talks, and then we'll move into the Q and A. I'm afraid we are going to run over time. I suspect. Uh, perhaps by 15 minutes or so. So if, if you're all happy for that, then we'll carry on with the, with the, with the question and answer session uh, at the end. Um, but I, I, I think everyone will agree with we've, we've, we've learned a huge amount and, and certainly it's been an extraordinary view of what is emerging from communities and from individuals driving through the agenda in, in really inspiring ways so far. Um, so with that, we'll move straight into, into our next talk, and this is going to be a hybrid hybrid uh, talk where we have um, two people talking. We've got uh, Dr. Simon Tilly and Nick Woolley talking from the Hopkinton Housing Project on Blue Green Solutions to Development. Uh, Simon, you're the online hybrid version, and Nick, you're definitely here in person, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll switch over to you now. So over to you, Simon. OK, thank you very much. I wonder if you could make it so I could share my screen um, and then I'll take you through uh, my slides. But while that's uh, being organised, hopefully um, I will introduce myself. So, yes, sorry, you've upped my qualifications, actually. Uh, I'm in charge of mechanical engineer rather than a doctor, but um, uh, thank you anyway. I, I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about what we've done in Hockerton, which is um, uh, a, a an example of autonomous housing that's been built by a community. And um, this is quite unusual still, uh, but one of the key things we've learned is that we have to think about problems in a new way. And uh, if we're going to be sustainable and tackle the environmental crisis that we have in front of us. And part of that is is the, the water system. So we're uh, autonomous for water. So we collect all our own water and um, and then uh, once we've used it, we treat it again, make it clean and put it back in the environment. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about how we've done that. And the important thing is to think about. Our, the way we live as a system, so the inputs and the outputs, there aren't really any inputs and outputs. It's a circular thing. We don't have really waste products. They're inputs into another part of the system. <laughs> we live in a world that's completely closed, if you like. Um, and so how we think about sewage, sewage is not a waste product. Sewage is a fantastic resource. And, and as soon as we um, get our heads around that, 
we suddenly find uh, we help the environment as well. So let me show you a few pictures. Do ask questions or gather your questions uh, for for the end. So hopefully if I start the slideshow and then share my uh, screen with you, um, you should be able to see it. Right, good. I'm hoping that you can see that. And um, uh, we have, so that's that's the houses where I live. We have um, all sorts of things going on here. Too much to talk about in, in this uh, 10 minutes. Um, but I will focus on the water systems uh, that we have. And um, this is an aerial shot of our five houses. You can see they uh, we built this lake and there is in fact a reed bed here. So we collect water from the site. Uh, we store it in a reservoir at the top of the hill um, and we use that in the houses. And then uh, subsequent to that, we, we we had a problem. You know, initially we were thinking, my goodness, what do we do with the sewage? Do we have composting toilets? Do we have a water-based system? If we have a water-based system, which we eventually chose, how do we deal with that? And what use can we make of it? And we, we suddenly realised it's a fantastic resource. So um, what we have in our sewage is a high nutrient level and we can make use of that to provide stuff for us. And then, and then we're talking uh, a useful product out of it and clean water. And so uh, you can see maybe just here at this end of the lake, uh, a reed bed, which is part of the sewage treatment system. And, and by the way, what you can see on this slide is the very barren nature of most farming and the way we currently live mostly is high density houses in town with lots of water runoff in the countryside causing uh, silt to run down the, the streams where we have a more, much more diverse um, system. And hopefully we have houses that people want to live in. So this is a picture of Trudy uh, in the house next door to me. And, uh, you know, we collect water off the roof, but actually the roof and this sun space is a fantastic place to be living. Um, and, and that's another key point that the systems and the way we live have got to be attractive for us to move towards them. So how did we deal with our sewage? So firstly, we considered, I think, primarily what on earth is going to be acceptable? And although composting toilets are probably better, we decided that actually, culturally, in this country, flush toilets are probably the way forward. Um, now we have, we have got some composting toilets, but the houses all have flush toilets. And this took us more time as a community group, probably than anything else to decide on. But yeah, there's nothing like talking toilets. Anyway, we uh, put in low water use toilets. That's an IFO toilet in the background there. And we created a design where we were going to use the uh, sewage to grow a reed bed, um, extract the nutrients, create an environment in which we could uh, subsequently grow fish and also make the water clean enough so we can enjoy it uh, for, for ourselves as well. Oh, and by the way, make a fantastic habitat for wildlife which is definitely uh, you know, a positive. So it's, it's working for people, it's working for the environment, um, and it's working financially because we're not having to pay a large water company. So it, uh, it does actually tick a lot of the environmental boxes. Uh, so how does the system work? In summary, it's uh, settlement tanks, into different depths of uh, a sewage, uh, a reed bed system, which is very different to most. This is a floating reed bed. The, re the roots of the reeds dangle down in the water and all the action goes on on the surface of those reeds where the oxygen is supplied and all the bacteria get going. It flows around this sort of spiral shape. That's to create a long retention time um, and eventually goes out through this gabion wall, which is made of limestone uh, and finally into the lake. And this is a plan. So you've got different zones within uh, the treatment area, the anoxic zone in the middle where there's less oxygen and slowly it gets more and more oxygen as it flows around and eventually out through the Gabion dividing wall into the lake. Uh, this is it under construction and you can see the lake filling up here. This is where the reed bed is going to go. This is the Gabion wall that 
is going to allow the final filtration to take place. Uh, we planted it up and this is interesting because typically perhaps when you're building houses you don't think about the landscaping first but we actually had to put that in place because when we moved in we wanted to be able to use the uh, toilets obviously and um, having the reed bed there and up and running so we planted the reed bed initially uh, before we actually started building the houses so it was there and 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 this is going to be extracting the nutrients and and really the problem of sewage goes away because we're creating a fantastic habitat here and any uh, and the reeds are growing and extracting nutrients and any leftover go into the main body of the lake. You can see here, this is a summer picture, very, uh, very sort of good growth and strong growth. And in the lake, amongst other things, we have fish. So we put in mirror carp um, and of course they grow and they're effectively eating the bugs. The bugs are eating the uh, plants. The plants are growing via the nutrients. And then we, we fish them out sometime later and we have fantastic resource. We have, uh, that's, a, um, that's a common carp and uh, they grow uh, to a great size. And we have to extract those from the lake because that takes out the nutrient load and obviously gives us a fantastic um, benefit in, in, in lots of ways. So, you know, we are doing this in all the systems we have on site. We we are growing fish, we're growing food, but we don't see anything as a waste. It all goes back in to the system. And, and as long as you think of a system approach to how we build, we will deliver a way that's both sustainable economically, socially and environmentally and not have the disastrous impacts that we are currently having. So uh, it's obviously been difficult. Uh, there's a lot of issues that we have, as we've seen throughout all those other presentations. But hopefully this is a good news story in that it demonstrates for five houses, uh, you really can create a system that is uh, net positive, both for, for both for wildlife, for us uh, and for our uh, sort of bank balance. Now, what we're going to look at uh, next with Nick is some of the issues that are currently being caused by the way we're currently doing things. So I'm going to hand over to um, Nick Woolley now uh, to take over. Nick, uh, are you there? Over to you. hugely informative and inspiring too. Um, I first uh, met up with uh, Simon uh, at, at Hockerton um, in and round about 2005 and very rapidly realised that the form of housing which they had taken forward uh, in the actual construction and performance uh, format was the only way forward for us all to go in in order to be having houses that are fit for the future. And having taken some 150 people, including my beloved wife, uh, around Harkerton uh, to their master classes, which I've done over about 15 years, I reckon it is about 150 people. It's small wonder that after all that, we are now taking forward our own super eco autonomous home, which is going to perform entirely to the Harkerton standard, and it's being built. Uh, under the the expert eagle eyes of both Simon and his um, uh, now semi-retired co-director Nick Martin, um, um, the two of them being really the responsible ones for the whole Hockerton project, but uh, having uh, learned their skills with the mighty Professor Brenda Vale, one of the great global gurus of cost-effective um, uh, operational uh, eco housing. And every single person I've taken around Harkerton has been completely blown away by what they've seen because uh, they they uh, uh, have got such they've got such an impressive place there uh, that has been uh, uh, monitored first of all by the BRE and ever since then 
uh, Simon uh, and Nick have continued on all the stacks with full costings so they can demonstrate that they can build really super homes that cost no more per square foot. All system, uh, services, everything included, planning fees, the lot, no more expensive than the houses per square foot put up by Mr. Barrett or for Simon or any of the other uh, builders that uh, are well known. Uh, and so I would certainly strongly recommend anyone who's interested in considering having an eco house that they uh, organize themselves to go to one of those master classes. Uh, I uh, ensured right from the start of uh, taking forward our, our own eco project that my builders and my uh, uh, building um, control surveyor fully understood the Hockerton ways and so I took them up to uh, an extended masterclass as well um, and so thanks to uh, Simon again for that. And my builder uh, who's uh, on site was so impressed by all he saw and by all he has found in the practical construction of our home that he will never go back to his pre hockerton construction form days. He's only interested in taking forward uh, homes that are fit for purpose for the people to whom he finally sells them. And he actually loves picking up the phone when anything happens on site that he wants to have clarified, picking up the phone and speaking either to Simon or Nick, because as he said to me with a wry grin over and over, it's just amazing. I ask them a question and they give me the answer in such an understandable and a very practical way. It's marvellous. Um, so uh, our new family home is in fact a class Q conversion from what was originally a very long chicken shed. And so it's got a wonderful long roof. Very excited I am because, yes, Simon, I don't think knows this yet, but the, uh, that uh, yesterday our batteries were attached to some 75 solar panels on the roof uh, of this long chicken shed, uh, which has got to deal not only with the everything that happens, all the energy requirement of the house, but also two fully electric cars, and it will do so, and already we are totally off grid. So that's, uh, I'm putting much more into the grid in these sunny days than we ever will think of taking out in the winter. Um, because time is short, I'm only going to talk today, following on from what uh, Simon has said, talking about our sewage system, because uh, uh, that, again, is built on exactly the same system as the one that you've just seen, beautiful pictures of at Hockerton. Uh, and so uh, the uh, primary and secondary treated water in conven fairly conventional uh, systems passes through into our reed bed uh, set over a pond. And that is now, I'm delighted to see, springing to life uh, in its first spring. And uh, again, like Hockerton, it was the first thing to be constructed because my, my wife and family and I are living in a mobile home 25 yards from the wall of our new home. And uh, thank goodness we are because there's a lot to watch. Now, my main uh, reason for uh, talking about sewage and how our reed bed removes all the remaining nutrients is really because of my professional day-to-day um, uh, -day work. My, my main individual client is in fact Zurich of Switzerland and uh, I, I, um, I act uh, for it on its two strategic rural portfolios as its UK fund asset manager and I've currently got some 20 development projects all around the, uh, the UK for uh, Zurich and one or two, well quite a few other large land owning clients as well. Uh, and in my work for the fund. I also represent it uh, as, as the member of the Home Builders Federation, the HBF, uh, which has it uh, among its members. Well, most of the firms of builders from the very largest to the very smallest because they provide uh, excellent information, briefings and, uh, and uh, do quite a lot of other work for the industry. And uh, they brought to all our attention on the 30th of June last year, the mega problem of nutrient neutrality about which we've been hearing a lot this morning uh, with nutrient management plans and so forth. Last June, therefore, 
they told us that some 30,000 building sites, uh, building plots, were, which either were allocated for development or had already outlined consent, could not be taken forward because the streams uh, and uh, groundwater in, in the areas uh, were over rich with nutrients, phosphate and, uh, and uh, uh, pos uh, yes, phosphate and, and uh, nitrogen, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, they told us then that we had really got to get our acts together if we wanted to build houses in such areas or extra areas as were declared. And uh, about two weeks ago, the HBF reckoned that that 30,000 sites had extended now to over 60,000. Uh, around the country. Uh, and then the bombshell really hit us last Thursday when I received my daily briefing on Thursday from the HBF with the headline reading, Natural England announces an additional 27 catchments covering 42 local authorities subject to nutrient neutrality requirements. And what this means for house builders, all new applications for house building and outline permissions awaiting approval or of reserve matters or those awaiting the discharge of conditions within the river catchment areas listed will be subject to the requirements to achieve nutrient neutrality. In other words, no in further enrichment. And local authorities can only approve homes if they are certain that the proposed development will have no negative effect on protected wetland areas. And with my old English nature hat on, quite right too. So since June, I've been working with the HBF uh, on this and introduced them to some of, through my old contacts of uh, Natural England, uh, some of the key people dealing with diffuse water pollution so that they could have a, a better understanding. Obviously, I was lucky I'd sat on the Council of English Nature for nine years. so. Uh, had a fairly good understanding of why this was so. The problem is that normal sewage treatment works do not remove nutrients. They are remarkably ineffective in it. On the other hand, sewage from homes is increasingly rich in nutrients, largely because of uh, uh, their inclusion to such a degree in such a vast number of household cleaning products. Um, so it's, it's, it's absolutely essential that we get to grips with this and certainly with my uh, fund asset manager's hat on, I need to be understanding far better how we can actually uh, deal with the problem in, as the government puts it, a nature-based solution of one sort or another and it will be different solutions for different situations to ensure that on the one hand, we're able to take forward the homes that are very much needed and a whole variety of places, and that there's not a complete stop on housing, but that in order to do that, we actually set them out and construct them uh, with the authorities that are relevant uh, in such a way that no further damage or enriching of the waters takes place. Uh, Quite clearly, the Hockerton reed bed, which I've got in my back garden now, uh, of the sort that Simon described, is one way which I believe, and having discussed this specifically with Natural England, I believe not in all situations by any means, but in a number of situations, that can work effectively um, uh, without taking undue land. Now, time is too short. Um, I won't say any more on this at the moment, but if anyone has any questions they would like to have an answer to, I'll do my best. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nick and, and Simon. And so we'll, we'll move straight over to Paul Parsland's uh, talk. Uh, Paul Parsland is, is part of Lawyers for Nature, and he'll talk about rights of rivers. I have, have to have that. Can everyone hear you that? Yeah. Probably best, isn't it? I'm afraid you'll need to keep it quite close to your mouth as well. Uh -huh. Okay. 
and we say yes, exuberant and all. <laughs> so why are you all here? It's, it's an honest question. Why, why have you chosen to spend the beautiful springtime day uh, in a lecture theatre and indeed online? And why do so many of you pour your, your life force, your energy, your passion into your work and protect me with all the incredible talks that we've seen today. Why do people do that? I think it's a, a, lot, a lot of the time it's a deep love and connection to nature and a desire to protect and restore it. And sometimes I think we don't make that case as much as we should. And that really impinges upon the effectiveness of our message. Because as the acronyms have multiplied, as the regulations have increased, as all of the agencies that are supposed to be doing this work have increased, so has the environmental destruction. So we know that the current system is not working and we need an alternative one. And I'm going to put you today in a very brief amount of time that I can, and with some questions afterwards, so do think of any that you'd like to ask me, that rights of nature is that, um, is that solution, or at least a key part of it. So what do we mean by rights of nature? Well, in simple terms, it means giving legal rights and personality to nature in the same way that humans have. Now, that immediately uh, might strike quite a large part of the population as a bit mad. And I'm still waiting for my first Daily Mail article about the mad barrister who wants to give human rights to trees and rivers. But actually, when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, because in addition to humans, the other um, entities that we give legal rights and personalities to don't even actually exist. So we think of companies, they become so ubiquitous now that we think of them as, as, as a thing that exists. But actually Thames Water is entirely imaginary. It's not actually a thing. It's a legal concept that we imagined and has only existed that entirely legal concept about 150 years. And yet we imbue it with more rights, personality, power and money than living entities which have existed on this island. Our rivers, many of them have flowed for tens of thousands of years before humans even came to these islands and will continue to flow long after we are gone. We somehow give Thames Water, a fictional entity, the power to destroy and damage real life things such as our rivers. Now to me, that is a form of madness that needs to be corrected. It is also, I believe, a key reason behind almost all of the destruction that we've seen in various talks today. I brought the programme down with to remind me of such interesting, incredible talks. At the root cause of so many of them is this ultimate fact that Thames Water has legal rights and personality and our rivers do not. I am. Um, uh, I'm part of a, uh, a grassroots river restoration project that I might talk about a bit more in a minute on the river roading in East London. And uh, about a year ago, I discovered a sewage overflow that was, was pouring tens of thousands of litres a day of raw sewage into the river. EA hadn't noticed, of course. Um, and um, it would probably still be doing so had we not noticed it. And at the time it was spewing this, this sewage into the river, um, to make a political point later on, um, I very awkwardly dangled myself over this kind of spewing overflow and, and got a five litre bottle of water of it to make a very key point, which is if I went to the Thames Water headquarters and threw that over their front desk, what do you think would happen to me? I would very quickly find myself collared and in the courts for criminal damage. So why is Thames Water allowed to continue doing that without any uh, without any restriction whatsoever. And I submit it's partially because the river is just seen as, as a nothing, as a resource to be exploited for human ends, and Thames Water has its legal rights and can enforce them. So Thames Water, well, Thames Water can't call the police because remember it's fictional, but the people who work for Thames Water will call the police on me. And the police will say, well, you're infringing upon Thames Water's rights, we're going to call it you. Even the police wouldn't get involved, of course. Thames Water would rapidly do something about it. And if, for instance, there was a, a sewer overflow going into um, Thames Water headquarters or the Houses of Parliament or maybe some of our great places of worship, St Paul's Cathedral, for instance, we would there'd be rapidly something done, done about it. You wouldn't just uh, say, oh, well, we'll maybe make a plan to do something about this in 20 years time um, because it's very expensive to fix it. No, it, something would happen. 
and that is because um, they have rights and can enforce them. So going into rights of nature a little bit more, um, although it may seem an odd concept, it has already um, been adopted in many countries around the world, um, particularly into various constitutions of South American countries. Um, but also, with regards to rivers, the most interesting example is the Wanganui River in New Zealand, which in 2017 was granted um, legal rights and personality, self-ownership, so it kind of owns itself, um, and the guardianship body to look after it. Now, the New Zealand system is almost, legal system is almost exactly the same as ours. So there's no legal impediment whatsoever to, it, to a river in this country having the same rights. The House of, uh, our Parliament could easily pass an act to give rights to the Thames, for instance, if it wanted to. The key blockage is in some ways a political one, um, which is in this country, we regard nature as a dead thing. We don't regard it as sacred. We don't regard it as alive. We regard it as a resource to be used, extracted and dumped upon for capitalism and human interest. That's the basic summary of it in political terms. And a crucial difference between us and countries that have enacted the right of nature is a strong indigenous voice. In most countries that have brought forward rights of nature, there's a strong indigenous voice of people who've never lost their connection to nature, who've never forgotten the fact that we are intrinsically linked and connected to nature and our existence is dependent upon nature. Those people have never forgotten it. And those are the ones who say, well, actually, if, if you're going to have this legal system where we grant imag imaginary fictions like companies' rights, then can we please at least grant our natural um, beings that we hold sacred rights? And that's exactly what happened in New Zealand. The Maori people, as part of their peace settlement with the New Zealand government, demanded that their sacred river be given rights. So if we know it's technically possible, but politically difficult, where does that leave us? I would say that leaves effectively all of us to act as that strong voice for nature. And obviously the word indigenous is, can have dodgy meanings when used in, in a country like the UK, but if, if it has to have a meaning I, in this country, I would say it's anybody, no matter where they come from, where you were born, what your passport says, who cares for these lands, who loves these lands and its rivers and nature, and will do what they can to peacefully protect them, which of course makes uh, uh, an asylum seeker who comes from Ukraine who actually looks after and cares for our rivers more indigenous than, um, say, uh, a politician who is willing to sell it off the nearest bidder to a private company. It's an interesting, interesting analysis. But the point is, in that sense, we are all that indigenous voice, or we must become that indigenous voice who is looking out for and protecting nature. We must be its guardians. And the interesting thing about it, and particularly following on from the amazing talks we've had today, is that actually many of us are already doing that. There's such incredible work happening already. And I really believe that rights of nature is in many ways just a prism, something that we reflect our existing work through to give it deeper meaning and to make it more effective and to bring other people in. Because if we begin, for instance, with, um, with CSOs to get too bogged down in statistics, then actually, we, we sort of play into the water companies' games where they say, well, it just costs too much to do. Or as some, someone from Thames Water said to me with my river, well, you know, we have to pour sewage into the river because uh, otherwise it would flood people's homes. Uh, uh, to which I said, well, actually, this is I live on I live on a boat. I said, this is, this, this is my home. You are pouring sewage into my home. And more than that, you're pouring sewage into the home of all the wildlife who live there, all the people who actually spend time on the river and who, who love it. And so, If we can begin to use rights of nature as the prism to put our existing work through, I believe it could have a powerful effect. And one of the things that uh, we at Lawyers for Nature is advocating for is for um, local communities to effectively um, go beyond the paralysis of central government over these matters, leap, behind, leap ahead of them, and just start uh, acting as if these rights of nature exist. So taking rights of nature declarations, declaring them maybe in some form of ceremony, and then actively working to put those into effect. Um, so, um, for instance, on the River Roding, where uh, I uh, moved to five years ago, I've effectively become 
uh, a form of river guardian, I guess. Just I just took on that thing because I, I felt it was something that should, should happen. So I moved there uh, on a boat and um, I set up a community who is uh, effectively acting as river guardians, trying to uphold the rights of the river. And what's really fascinating is the legal context and the physical context is exactly the same as five years ago. But the entire way, not the entire, but a significant way the river is viewed has changed, both for local people, the water companies, politicians, all other stakeholders within that, within that river catchment. The river, there's something fundamentally shifted just because of the way that we use rights of nature to channel our guardianship and our activism through. You know, when I go to catchment meetings and someone from Thames Water uh, gives a long speech about why they might potentially maybe do something about some of the sewage in 25 years time, if it's affordable, I say, well, that's completely unacceptable. This is my river. I believe this river to be sacred and alive, and I will do whatever it takes to protect it peacefully. And if that includes damaging your business in whatever way I can peacefully, then I will do so. I believe that that statement has a power to it and has more power than if we just deal with stats and in bare regulations. But the joy of it is when we marry the two together, there's a deep power there. If we can take some of this statistical work and this work over the regulations and then go in alliance with ordinary people who love their river and want to protect it, I believe something deeply powerful could be unleashed. I'm already working and speaking to many activist groups around the country, as I'm sure many of you are, and there's a real resurgence in this like desire to protect rivers. We saw that over the sewage um, issue in the environment bill. But people need direction. And I believe some of the amazing um, uh, academic work that we've seen here today could really form a basis of that. So as an example, we could have people who um, who do write a rights of rivers declaration and declare it. That obviously has no legal effect. But if we then give people a toolkit to help them implement that within the current legal and political system, I believe it could have a, a power to it. So, for instance, we might have three streams for every right, sort of a practical, a legal and an activism. So for um, sewage, we could say, I believe my river has a right to be free of sewage and I will do whatever I can peacefully to uphold that right. In the first toolkit, there might be some of this explicit, um, how to do a um, outfall safari. We can include some of the excellent material we saw earlier about uh, misconnections and some of the uh, water testing stuff that we saw, how, how you can do citizen science. In the second one, we, second stream, we could include um, some of the excellent information we had in the first talk about um, the legal position on the Water Framework Directive and the fact that many of these are illegal and also how to um, perhaps launch a private prosecution. And the third one, under activism, if all that fails, well, not even if it all fails, under the third one, we have activism, which gives that, that fire, that push for the water companies to actually do something. So we could publish all of their head offices um, and all their list of their main shareholders and tell people what the legal position on certain forms of protest are. Because we know that Thames Water will do whatever is profitable. That's the entire um, meaning behind their organisation, this fictional organisation that exists, is to make money. So if we let them get away with it, they will continue to destroy our rivers if it's profitable to do so, and they're able to do so. That, that's just a, a fact of the way companies are and what their purpose is. So we need to provide that activism to get them to change. And for every single right that we can imagine a river having, we can provide people with the tools to actually make a practical difference within the current system. Again, rubbish. Here's how to collect uh, here's how to organise a community uh, letter, letter um, pick day. Here's the legal uh, situation on waste. We had some interesting things in the first talk about the responsibility of packaging producers. Thirdly, here's a list of all the main brands and their head offices and some of the things you can do. So I really believe that rights of nature and rights of rivers is a powerful tool to use what we're already doing and to put it through a lens that will really inspire people and I think truly make a difference. Because in addition to this work that everyone's doing, we fundamentally need a complete shift in our worldview, which is to see nature effectively as sacred, as something we are intrinsically part of, um, and which we want people to really fall in love with again, I suppose.
and I think rights of nature is a, a vehicle for that. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Are you sure? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you warmed it for me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for, for that uh, inspiring talk, Paul. And actually, it's, it's a reminder of the founding aims, the foundational aims that, 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 uh, that, that Martin Polden, who was here earlier on, and Diana Schumacher, and indeed my old mentor, David Hall. Uh, brought into into force when they when they set up the Environmental Law Foundation, and that's that without the communities and the people who are directly affected by environmental damage, without providing them with the tools to address and to help revive and address the situations that they find themselves in, then nothing can change. And so, as 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 we come to the end and as we come into the the, the question and answer session and the close of, of of this particular meeting, um, I just wanted to remind ourselves about the, 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 the instigation of this workshop and potentially some more workshops to come. And that's really the uh, many of the forces, the drivers that are forming the degradation of, of the environment that we're all exposed to are not getting any better. So those underpinning driving forces, whether it's population change, whether it's climate change, whether it's underlying thresholds of change for, for, for environmental stability, those are not getting any better. And so this activity and activities like this that we sit in are really key mechanisms for us to understand how we as communities, as you say, much of the world that we live in is now imagined. And we have the power as the people, as the communities to, to enforce change and to make that change. But we need to get ahead of these these degradative drivers, and so these kinds of meetings and workshops, but perhaps maybe even a small part of it, but a but a part of that of that evolving understanding. And so I'd like, to, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone in in, in the final in this final session, but also the earlier sessions, uh, for all of their really key inputs and, and the information that's been provided, and, and really the passion that's been, that's been provided and shown through. Um, so now we'll move into the into the Q and A session. But I'd like to welcome uh, Alex uh, Shattuck, in particular from Landmark Chambers, um, to to give a, a brief introduction. He said it would be brief. You didn't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, to to the work that you've been involved in around house building, um, sewage capacities, and LPAs. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I'd also like to, to, to thank you, Alex, for the, the role that you've played in supporting the Environmental Law Foundation. So, Alex, over to you. It's very kind. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so, basically, you know, I'm only talking to him for a few minutes rather than 15. And, and it's on this point um, that Philip Dunn made right um, at the start of this fantastic conference this idea that local authorities don't have to defer to water companies regarding the impact. Um, of development on the sewer networks, uh, which means there is something that all these amazing citizen scientists we've heard from today um, can do, um, other than uh, try and bash the EA's door down, which they should be doing as well. Um, in my experience, in my work with ALF recently, um, local authorities um, think they have to do um, what the what companies um, say about you know about capacity, and they have to take it on trust basically. So, say a developer comes along and says, "I want to build 100 houses." Um, and the local bank authority asks to say Northumbrian water, in Bob Latin's case, um, is okay. Um, Northumbrian water might come back and say, yes, that's fine. Uh, we have this amazing set of CSOs, we have this interceptor tunnel, it's brilliant, all fine, crack on, we can connect it to the tunnel. So, what does a local authority um, do with an answer like that? Most of them think they have to take it on trust, but that's not quite right. Um, I don't blame them for getting this wrong. Um, the interaction uh, of planning law and planning policy. Um, it's extremely complicated um, in a way that only seems to uh, benefit uh, lawyers like me and Paul sometimes. Um, as one of George Bernard Shaw's characters said, um, all professions are conspiracies against the laity. Um, but here's what paragraph 188 of the advice and MPBS says. The focus of planning policies and decisions should be on whether proposed development is an acceptable use of land rather than the control of processes or emissions 
uh, which are subject to separate pollution control regimes. Um, so surely the RPA might say that means that we shouldn't be thinking about pollution, really. We can leave it to the Environment Agency, we can leave it to Northumbria Water. And that's only true, though, uh, if you read this paragraph of the MPPF in isolation, uh, which, spoiler alert, you shouldn't. Um, paragraph 174 of the MPPF notes that planning decisions should contribute to and enhance the natural and local environments by inter alia, preventing new and existing developments from contributing to um, being put at an acceptable risk from or being adversely affected by unacceptable levels of soil, air, water, or noise pollution. So the MPPF directs LPAs to look at pollution. Paragraph, paragraph 185, similar as well. Paragraph 186. Planning policies and decisions should sustain and contribute towards compliance with relevant limit values or national objectives for pollutants. So the very brief point is, far from warning local planning authorities off from doing their own assessment of pollution impacts, national planning policy seems to actively encourage them to roll up their sleeves and get involved, make their own assessments about whether new development is going to have uh, a, a negative pollution impact um, on the local environments or not. Um, they can take on trust um, what the water companies say, um, but they don't have to. Um, and there's a case law um, on that choice right coming to Gates said, um, NBC case, the Hopkins development case, um, uh, a few other cases as well. But just briefly, there's a glimmer of hope there. If citizen scientists have all this data, um, you don't just have to send it off to the Environment Agency, you can send it to local planning authorities too, um, ask them to take it into account before putting even more strain um, on the sewers uh, and remind them that as a matter of law, uh, they're entitled to form to form their own view. So just a, just a very minor point that I wanted to, to, to make there, and I've been doing some work for Deep Health uh, on this particular issue, it's just very interesting and it's surprising um, how many local planning authorities um, aren't aware uh, that they can make their own assessment here. Okay, so let's move through into the question and answer session. Um, so I've seen a couple of points come up online, but if, if um, anyone online has any specific questions they'd like to ask um, members of the panel or to all of us in the panel, then please do either type them in or raise your hand and, and we'll make sure that we get around, get around to you. Um, are there any questions here in the room? Can I ask you just to name yourself and then, and then ask your question? Okay, uh, my name is Will Hawke. I'm a chartered mechanical engineer, so I, and uh, I'd just like to make some general observations first of all. Can you hear me all right, by the way? Yeah. Good. Um, we have had a most marvellous set of uh, experts talking to us today, very learned, very well versed in what they say, and I think they should all be. Congratulated. Um, I would include that the, the people who are taking an active part in uh, highlighting problems in, for instance, the, um, the sea and the rivers around us. Um, there's clearly a situation, um, I think I would say about two thirds of today, we've had some very bad news sprinkled in with the good. Uh, the last three speakers have given us some very good news, which is heartwarming. So, congratulations to you. Um, but, the answer to bad news is the very disquieting situation with the EA and the fact that they're not just useless, they're worse than useless. They're not doing the job. Together with that, the water authorities are not doing the job that we pay them to do. We all pay water rates, but they're not treating the sewage correctly, or not treating it at all. And this is an absolute uh, disgrace to the whole country and to these uh, companies. Uh, one of the speakers said that more money uh, cannot be provided to the water companies because they, um, uh, the, the government wishes to maintain water rates at a steady level without inflation. Uh, but the income to the water companies since privatisation has increased. 
because of the number of ratepayers, which is in line with when you go all over the country, you see uh, new building developments, new housing estates being put up. So there must be a huge increase in actual income because simply of the number of ratepayers. And they've done nothing with this. They've made no improvements whatsoever, as far as I can see. Um, I'll give you an example. Well, I'm, um, really, I'm really sorry because we're so, we're, we're so short of time. All right. Do you have a question? Would you yeah, the question is, has anyone um, come across uh, a system which I saw up in Socon Trent area uh, in the mid-80s where a digester was being used to treat the sludge which is produced by the incoming sewage waste? That digester system produced power in form of heat and methane predominantly, which is a form of uh, fuel. It seemed to be a very good 